I'm Joel Hoffman, Executive Director of Viscaya Museum and Gardens, and I am so happy to welcome you to Viscaya this evening. I'm just going to take a little stroll in the front door, and I will say it's a, it's a pretty quiet evening here at Viscaya, considering it's a town hall. Not too much town here, but I'm really glad that you've all joined us. We came up with this plan of establishing a town hall because we just realized that there's so much going on at Viscaya. We wanted to make sure that we found some time to tell our family, friends, supporters, advocates, um, what we're up to. Um, as I'm taking a stroll, I would be remiss if I did not point out our incredibly good friends and patrons, Barbara Deering Danielson and Marion Deering McCormick. If you don't know about these two extraordinary women, they spent about 25 years trying to figure out how to preserve Vizcaya after their uncle James Deering passed away without having a will in which Vizcaya was actually named, by the way. So it was pretty complicated for them to figure out what would happen to this incredible place. If you haven't been back for a while and you haven't seen our enclosed loggia with that extraordinary leaded glass, just a little glimpse of that. I'm gonna be taking our call this evening in the extraordinary Vizcaya courtyard, which is really the hub of this unbelievable National Historic Landmark treasured house. Hopefully the phone will cooperate and follow me here. And um, the courtyard is really the center of where we welcome our visitors. It's kind of the heart of the house thematically from a public perspective. And it also really gives you a kind of a great introduction to the relationship between inside and out with all the extraordinary um, horticulture that's, that's going on here. So the, the feature of our program this evening will be my two colleagues, um, Ian Simpkins, our Senior Director of Horticulture, get the reference to plants that I made, and Wendy Wolf, our Chief Engagement Officer who handles all the people stuff. Before introducing um, Ian and Wendy, I just wanted to share a couple of things that are happening at the sky. And I will say that it seems like we are hopefully emerging from the pandemic in good shape. The visitation here is really strong. It seems like uh, anyone who was remotely thinking about getting married over the last couple of years is having an urgent press to make that happen at Fiskaya as soon as possible and, and really who can blame them. Um, we also, I will say, if you haven't been back in a while, really have made tremendous headway at Fiskaya during the pandemic. Among the things that we completed relative to preservation of property uh, include the, the replacement of six roofs, including the roof over the main house. That was a big complicated project. Um, we've also reopened our rehabilitated cafe and we restored the uh, incredible waterfront features, the barge, the boat landing and the tea house, which are really looking about as spectacular as they probably did the first day James Deering saw this property completed. So if you haven't been by recently, please do come and check them out. We're also um, very soon gonna be moving forward with the next phase of our work in the Vizcaya village. Um, that's gonna include creating um, horticultural facilities, a really important thing I'm sure from Ian's perspective. And um, if you have not noticed uh, in the last year, we've already made some pretty significant headway and really uh, mobilizing and activating that space through our really popular farmer's market, which um, we held every Sunday in partnership with Urban Oasis uh, Project. So um, it's a great time to visit. I will say, although uh, my colleagues and I are stuck in our offices a lot, um, every day out here just seems more beautiful than the day before. So without further ado, I would um, like to introduce my colleague, Ian Simpkins, who is going to um, first be appearing via video um, and then we'll be uh, present to um, answer some questions that you may have. Ian is our Senior Director for Horticulture and Sustainability, and he is responsible for developing and overseeing all of the museum's horticulture, um, sustainability, and urban agriculture programs. So that includes restoration and interpretation of the formal gardens, as well as um, the many and varied natural areas. Ian holds a Bachelor of Science degree in horticulture from uh, North Carolina State University, and his tenure in horticulture extends more than 25 years. We're incredibly fortunate that um, approximately 18 of those 25 years um, have been at Vizcaya. Um, Ian was just a, a wee 
toddler when he started here. Sorry, Ian, hopefully you can get me back during the Q&A, but um, Ian has really been here, developed and um, significantly expanded and enhanced our horticulture program. Joking aside, prior to his appointment at Vizcaya, Ian held the position of executive director at Jofuso Japanese House and Garden in Philadelphia. He's also served on the boards of the Tropical Arborist Guild and Greater Philadelphia Gardens. Ian's recipient of the Chantelier Foundation and J.C. Ralston Fellowships, and he's former chair of the Historic Landscape Section of the American Public Gardens Association, and has served on the Horticulture Advisory Committee of the Kampong National Tropical Botanical Garden. Um, probably many of you um, know Ian and have long admired the work that um, he and his team have done, and um, I know that we all are grateful to have him on board in our I'm excited to hear his presentation. Hello again, everyone. Ian Simpkins, Senior Director of Horticulture and Sustainability here at Viscaya Museum and Gardens. And I'm sharing with you a really important milestone that we have reached this year. And that is the 100th anniversary of our main gardens. I know many of you are familiar with our gardens, whether from seeing them online or being here in person. It's really interesting to know that in 1916, when the main house was finished, which is a centennial we celebrated a few years ago with many of you, the gardens were not here. They had just begun to be constructed, but much of it was still mangrove swamp, much of it was still tidal marsh, and a significant amount of work had to be done to get the gardens to the state that you see them today. Mr. Deering, who was Vizcaya's owner and patron, decided to build the house and the gardens right here on the edge of Biscayne Bay, which was an extremely difficult choice and one that was not advised uh, by his contemporaries. But he decided to do it anyway, and so it involved a significant amount of work doing things that you would never be able to do today to get the gardens to where they are now. As I mentioned, the gardens were mangrove swamp and tidal marsh and salt marsh and a variety of coastal ecosystems, as you can see in some of the historic photos we have that were taken when the property was purchased. And that had to be cleared, that had to be graded, and it had to be drained. And that was a significant amount of work and resulted in a labyrinth of lagoons and canals and other features that are now occupied by uh, the Archdiocese of Miami property to our south. And so that was a Herculean feat. And because it was, it took a very long time to construct the gardens. So this is our very first trivia question. What kind of landscape existed here before the formal gardens were created? If you would like to take a stab at the question and potentially win a Vizcaya membership, please go ahead and put your answer in the chat. Um, and Rebecca will be standing by to look for those answers. She will randomly select someone and then the winner will also be announced in the chat. Look for emojis to make it nice and easy to, to see and find. We're gonna go ahead and move on with the presentation. That coupled with the war, World War I, which broke out uh, during the construction of the gardens, they took almost eight years to complete. So by the time they were finished, they were in much the state that you see them today. And Mr. Deering, who was an engineer at heart, who was responsible for many of the inventions that International Harvester came up with during his tenure there, uh, really was very keen on technology and he wanted things built to uh, cutting edge standards that we think of as commonplace today. For example, many of the garden structures and the main house were built from poured reinforced concrete in that they constructed a metal cage, built forms, and then poured concrete into those forms, which was then strengthened by the uh, metal bars that were inside the concrete. At that time, it was extremely innovative and not many people were doing it, but he saw fit to do it. And because those features were so over-constructed and so well-built for their time, that's why they're still here today. 
We're right on the shores of Biscayne Bay. We are in a really hurricane prone region. Not to mention the weather here generally is very harsh. We have salt air, we have constant wind, heavy rains, drought, you name it, it's here in South Florida. And it takes a heavy toll on gardens and it takes a heavy toll on structures. And the fact that they're all still here a hundred or more years later is testament to the skill with which they were constructed. Trivia question number two. Hopefully this is an easy one. What was the name of James Deering's, James Deering's company? Um, and as you might have guessed, these are all things that are coming up in the presentation. So hopefully we are paying attention. Go ahead and put your answers in the chat and hopefully somebody will win a Vizcaya membership. Let's keep it going. When the gardens were created, there were several steps that Mr. Deering and his team took which were very wise and greatly contribute to why the gardens are still here today. Even though a lot of the mangrove forest that occupied the southern part of the property was eliminated and destroyed, along the eastern perimeter of the main formal gardens that still remain today, Mr. Deering chose to leave the mangrove forest intact. As a result, we have the largest and oldest mangroves in Southeast Florida. And that was a very wise choice for him. Not only does it protect the gardens from salt winds, which he intended it to do, but it also holds fast the entire Eastern portion of the gardens that interface with the bay. So if the gardens uh, had been cleared all the way to the bay and a retaining wall built, they would have been subject to the full force of Biscayne Bay, not only during normal weather, but also during king tides and also during hurricanes. But because the mangroves were left, they have held the entire por eastern portion of the main gardens intact, and that has enabled the main gardens to survive to the extent that they are today, which is fascinating because they're entirely built upon fill right next to a major water feature. And the fact that they're even still here at all after all the storms that we've had and 100 years of weather is really testament to the strength of the mangroves and their ability to hold a shoreline together. And so that brings us to the subject of resilience. You know, resilience is a word that's thrown about a lot these days for good reason. In this era of climate change and sea level rise, where we're facing stronger storms, higher seas, more extremes of climate, saltier ocean water, it's really important to have a grasp of how a garden like this can withstand those intensifying and more destructive conditions that are already here and will get worse in our future. I believe this is our last trivia question. So if you have not guessed yet, I would highly encourage you to try to participate in the chat. What are some of the climate related, climate change related dangers and issues Vizcaya's gardens face to date? We literally just covered that. So hopefully this is an easy question. For the past 10 years, we have been working on our tree canopy. In the main gardens, we have many large and old trees and a lot of them date to the completion of the gardens back in 1922 and some were planted even earlier we have records of trees being planted in 1917 and we have trees that were there long before the gardens were created so because we have a large and old tree canopy that occupies a very significant place in the gardens, it's important for us to ensure that they are as resilient as possible. And we trim the tree canopy really with three goals in mind. Uh, the first is the safety of our visitors while the gardens are open. Um, old trees can sometimes fail and uh, we do not want that to happen while we are open and have visitors in the gardens. 
Secondly, we want our tree canopy to be as strong as possible during hurricanes. And an average hurricane here can feature wind gusts of 100 miles per hour or more. And in the case of a Hurricane Irma, we had wind speeds like that for 18 hours, which is a significant strain on any tree canopy, no matter how healthy it is. It's important for us to ensure that the trees can withstand hurricanes as much as possible. Thirdly, a maintained tree canopy is a healthy tree canopy. Just like you and I, we need to maintain our bodies and so do trees, but trees can't really do it for themselves in the way that we would like them to in this heavily visited uh, garden. And so we employ uh, current arboricultural techniques uh, with our staff and with uh, tree contractors to ensure that our tree canopy is as healthy as possible. And by doing that, we can extend its life significantly. Historically, the gardens did not flood or flooded very minimally, but because of sea level rise and intensifying hurricanes, we now have to worry about storm surge, even in minor storms. And Hurricane Irma, we had four feet, in some places more, of storm surge running through the entire gardens. The entire main garden flooded both north and south. Irma was one thing, but even in tropical storms or minimal hurricanes, we can get storm surge overtopping the uh, seawall here and the uh, South Sea Arm. And recently, we had a tropical storm, which was a minimal tropical storm, come through. It was Isaias. And we had storm surge overtopping the retaining wall here where the gardens meet the bay. So it's going to become a, a more critical thing for us to consider and we're already taking steps to mitigate storm surge. As many of you know, we recently installed a uh, flood control solution that we can inflate and deflate as uh, needed. But we're also looking at other situations too, such as how plants can respond to salt water, how resilient can they be? And not only that, but how resilient will these plants be in the face of water restrictions, in the face of uh, lower fertilizer applications, and in the face of more extreme weather? Those are questions that we're asking ourselves today as we begin to face the next 100 years with the realization that the next 100 years will not be like the first 100. There'll be a, a real test of the infrastructure of the gardens here. And so, to kick off the next 100 years, we will be embarking on a very ambitious program to restore the main formal gardens. And that will not only include the things you see, but it will include the things that you don't see, such as restoring all of our plumbing, restoring all of our electric, and figuring out how to put those in protective structures that will allow them to be resilient to flooding, that will allow them to be resilient to earth shifts, that will happen as sea, uh, sea water begins to upwell into the soils. And it will also help us to uh, understand how visitors now run through the gardens, because this was a private garden that has now been adapted to public use. And this restoration will also enable us to determine things that we can do to enhance the infrastructure of the main gardens so that they're better able to withstand 300,000 visitors a year versus maybe 500 that it would have received back in James Deering's day when it was a private garden. So there are a lot of factors that are coming into play now which can alter the trajectory of the gardens in the future, but we feel very confident that what we're doing today will enable the gardens to be every bit as resilient and every bit as strong in the face of these anticipated changes and anticipated challenges so that a hundred years from now my successor will be having the same discussion with your successors. So we've got a lot of changes happening and we're super excited about them. You can participate too. We would love for you to come and volunteer in the gardens. We have weekly volunteer opportunities. Check our website, viscaya.org, for opportunities about volunteering. And we hope to see you here in the gardens.
So Ian, what do you, what's kept you here for, for 15 years? And what are you most excited about in the next couple of years? Um, you know, the, there's been a few things that have uh, kept me here for 15 years. Um, one is that uh, it's, it's a challenge uh, every day to keep things moving forward. Um, and it's a challenge in a positive way in that, um, you know, uh, I, I think managing a garden and gardening for that matter is really rewarding because uh, it, it's a somewhat um, short window of return, if you will. You know, it's, it's one of the few things that you can do where you can see almost immediate improvements. And so that's really satisfying. But, um, uh, you know, it's been really rewarding to, um, you know, over time uh, work on not only bringing the, the physical uh, aspects of the gardens uh, closer to where they were originally, but also working toward making sure that uh, the gardens uh, are, are cared for current, uh, according to, you know, the best standards that we have making sure that we've got policies and procedures in place to ensure that, you know, um, uh, we do everything that we can in our power to maintain the gardens to the best we can. And, you know, honestly, it's, it's uh, exciting that the restoration um, of the gardens is coming up soon. It's something that we've been talking about for a long time. And uh, to uh, have that almost knocking on our doorstep is a really exciting thing and and i'm really looking forward to that ian what do you what do you think makes the sky's gardens most special other than the fact that we undoubtedly have um, more iguanas and related <laughs> reptiles than any other formal garden in the united states for sure and definitely have um uh more quinceanera photo shoots yeah. than uh, probably any other public garden in, uh, certainly again in the United States, two, two highly distinguished characteristics of the yeah. sky, but I bet you've got a couple others up your sleeve. Yeah, yeah, though a, a good friend of mine is a director of horticulture at a pretty prominent garden in LA, and, and I think um, they're, uh, they rival us for the uh, number of photo shoots that, that they have going through the gardens with quinceaneras and weddings and, and all of those things. But um, yeah, so I think there, there are a lot of things that make the Vizcaya Garden special, you know, and it's not that, um, you know, they're the best of their kind in the United States, according to the National Trust. And, you know, they're one of the, the most unique gardens in the United States, if not the world. You know, the fact that there's a formal European garden uh, that is here in Miami using plants adapted to and native to South Florida, you know, is, is a pretty miraculous thing to see and experience. Um, you know, but I, I think really the things that, that make this garden so special, um, you know, is that they're, they're evocative and they're magical. Um, and they are also very personal. You know, they are the creation of someone uh, who had a, a really strong vision and uh, brought that into reality. And, um, you know, that person knew uh, exactly what they wanted to create and they did it uh, with, a purpose in mind, and that is to transport people in the gardens to another place in time. And so, you know, with the forced patina that the gardens were, uh, you know, built into and the sort of half overgrown nature of them and the buoyancy of the, the foliage around them, I, I think it really transports people to somewhere else. And I think it, it really kind of evokes a, a sense of uh, wonder and a sense of um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, a sense of magic, really. You know, uh, I've been to a lot of gardens here in the U.S. and Europe, other places, and 
Uh, I've been to very, very few that elicit an emotional reaction in me and an emotional reaction in other people. And I think that's what makes them special. That's a great answer, Ian. All right, last question for you. What do you say to our um, South Florida neighbors who might think that growing roses in this part of the world is, is uh, borderline impossible, if they're saying that? <laughs> Uh, well, I wouldn't say that it's an ent entirely a fool's errand. Uh, it can be done. And we have an excellent Rosarian on staff in our horticulturist, Marco uh, Perez Alvarez. He's responsible for the care of the Rose Garden. And um, as, as you may or may not know, roses were tried here at the beginning of the garden, you know, and uh, they failed. And um, they did not try it again. And so we're bringing back the original rose garden and the original configuration. And uh, this time we have a hundred years of knowledge and, and research behind us um, in that there are a lot of people out there who are really well versed in growing roses in tropical and semi-tropical regions. And so we've uh, worked with them to uh, acquire rose varieties and species that will do really well here in Miami. Um, so, but that said, it does require work and it does require some effort and it does require replacement. You know, we can't plant a rose here and expect it to last forever. We do have, uh, you know, a replacement schedule that we, that we follow, but um, in general, it, it can be done, and uh, it, it's not as frustrating as you might think it would be. Thank you, Ian. Well, thank you from the bottom of all of our hearts for the amazing job that you and your team do to, to care for these gardens under very difficult circumstances. Thank you. Fortunate so to have I, an amazing team of talented people. Indeed. Thank you. So uh, yeah, it's getting a little dark in this guy's courtyard. I'm not usually here alone at night. I'm hoping there won't be any ghosts emerging out of the shrubbery in the near future. But I will therefore without, ooh, that's looking a little Blair Witch for those of you who recall that. It's dark enough that I'm not sure I can see my notes. I'm not really trying for the Blair Witch effect. Joel, you can, clip that, you can clip that light to the top of the phone and it'll, it'll be a little better. Hopefully not <laughs> as bad as my light is, but. It you know, will be fine, it'll be fine. I kind of like the Blair Witch effect. That's not really that common at Vizcaya. All right, by magic, the lights have come on. So I, it now gives me great pleasure to welcome my colleague, um, Wendy Wolf, who is Vizcaya's chief engagement officer. And uh, Wendy works with the team that oversees engagement and cultural resources at Vizcaya. Um, like Ian, Wendy joined Vizcaya um, quite some time ago, in her case in 2006, as our school youth and family programs manager. And then in 2015, Wendy transitioned into the role of deputy director for learning and community engagement. Prior to joining Vizcaya, Wendy held the position of curator of education at the Low Art Museum at the University of Miami. Wendy was also an adjunct lecturer in museum studies at Florida International University for 10 years from uh, 2005 to 2015. Throughout her career, Wendy has held leadership positions with professional community networks to advance and support education and cultural engagement. She's also served in various leadership roles with the National Art Education Association's Museum Division most notably, and what I think most of you will probably consider fairly specialized in Arcane, um, Wendy served as a team member of a 10 year long national research initiative to study the impact of single art museum visits on student learning. I, I suspect Wendy might say a little bit more about that. <clears throat> we were all really proud when in 2010, Wendy received national recognition as the Southeastern region Museum Education Art Educator of the Year from the National Art Education Association. Wendy holds master's degrees in museum education from the University of Texas at Austin and a bachelor's degree in art history from Connecticut College. Um, like Ian, Wendy is an extraordinary colleague and I am 
uh, appreciative of her participating with us this evening and happy to turn the camera over to Wendy. Thank you. Hello, everyone. You're getting a little bit of a behind the scenes. I'm in my office here at Vizcaya, and I'm just going to work on sharing my screen, uh, sharing my PowerPoint screen here. <laughs> uh, uh, from beginning. Share screen. Great. So I think you can all see my screen at this point. Great. I'll go ahead and get started and look forward to sharing with you tonight um, how this guy is really a, a vibrant um, public space and how during uh, the pandemic, this guy was a restorative place for our community and also for artists, both individual artists and also arts organizations. Throughout 2020 and 2021, Vizcaya hosted a variety of cultural experiences on site. Um, we had artists from the Bakehouse, as you can see um, down here in the left. Um, Augusto is working in the courtyard of the main house, um, makes, the, makes the artistic process um, available to visitors to Vizcaya. We hosted a performance um, choreographed by Julian Goodwin Ferris as part of the To Miami with Love series by Miami City Ballet. And we also hosted uh, the Rainbow Circus Miami, which was part of Arched on the Road from the Adrian Arsh Center. So these resulted in low density, safe cultural access, keeping people connected with the arts in Miami. We were also able to continue one of our contemporary arts program initiatives with the public art performance Spectral Vizcaya. And this was commissioned with Miami artist Sebastian Duncan Portuando. And he activated Vizcaya through an innovative, sensory, and immersive art experience. We have a short video that I'll share. Um, and I can describe a little bit about the video um, as it's playing. I'll give you, oops, sorry. I was gonna adjust the volume there. I think it'll give you a little bit of a sense um, of how immersive and sensory uh, and special this experience really is. There are volunteers who are moving the shape and light around to activate you know, the facade of the house. And you can see visitors participating in that process as well. Apparitions repopulated the gardens for a festive night of phantom memories that returned for a winter party, reminiscent of the Deering era. These are flags made by um, community members in partnership with the artist, rum runners, bootleggers throughout the estate, thinking about Prohibition era in Miami 100 years ago. And you'll see shortly, uh, community members work with artist Sebastian um, to create the framework for the shadow theater. There were volunteers and artists who are performing. You can see volunteers who are manipulating the shapes and light um, during this performance that evokes uh, James Deering's time at Vizcaya 100 years ago. A little bit of behind the scenes to see how this comes together and works with many hands uh, supporting the artists, community built. We asked visitors to dress in their finest 1920s outfits to really evoke the spirit of the evening. They're welcomed by a gondolier at Vizcaya. Under a full moon, again, you can see the activated facade and synchronized swimmers um, in the pool. So again, many people came together from the community working in workshops um, in, in over a couple of months in December and January uh, 2021 and um, appreciate um, all the efforts and, and commitment that Sebastian made with us um, to make this happen. We wonder, uh, these are some ways that Vizcaya keeps people in Miami connected to the arts and when gathering indoors wasn't possible. And we wonder what your favorite Vizcaya memory might be. You can put it in the chat. Um, and and uh, Rebecca will will select a, a random winner for a Vizcaya membership. This is an O oh Miami poetry festival uh, at Vizcaya, right in front of the bay. Obviously, before the pandemic, we look forward to getting back to some of these partnerships. Vizcaya is also um, examined, and one of the ways that we examine our site and our resources is through the school program Wild Vizcaya. Wild Vizcaya is inspired by BioBlitz programs. <clears throat> They're 24 hours of citizen science 
and people come together to catalog all of the living things um, in a specific geographic area. So at Vizcaya, we're cataloging all of the living things um, in our formal gardens. You can see one of those related reptile iguanas um, here in the foreground of a wild Vizcaya program. So we're looking at plants, trees, insects, butterflies, marine life, seagrass. Students are collaborating with their peers. They're working with Vizcaya's horticulture team and also professional scientists um, from the Miami community. Can share a little bit about what that looks like. Again, as an immersive experience, um, these are students in the maize garden at the edge of the mangroves um, exploring that. You can see that they're, they're looking through the gardens with binoculars. There's a bird that you'll see sitting on one of the channel markers. Um, and they've got resources with them to see if they can identify what that species might be. As they're exploring the gardens, they can also take pictures with their cell phones. Um, you'll see that happen along the way. If plants um, or animals that they notice, they can head back to a station, connect with a scientist and work on identifying that and logging that into an app um, so we can build a record um, of the diverse species that are on site. Here they're moving through the David Klein Orchidarium, documenting an orchid and heading to the overlook. Again, looking closely with binoculars and thinking, thinking about what they see, looking at insects with microscopes um, and also looking closely at reptiles with herpetologists on site. So this is really, um, you know, demonstrates for us the, the wonderful biodiversity of um, this Gaia's formal gardens here in Miami's urban core and the importance of our green space to the community. Wild Vizcaya has been such a great model of a program that this spring, we're going to launch Creative Vizcaya, which will connect high school students with local artists to explore the visual arts in a similar manner, um, thinking about Vizcaya's design, architecture, and art collections. You can see here on the left, these are actually some high school students um, working on botanical illustration as part of one of our Wild Vizcaya programs. And on the right, you can see some students um, who are participating in our fantastical Vizcaya program, who are drawing some of the mythical creatures that you see throughout Vizcaya's furnishings and fixtures in the house and sculptures in the gardens. We know high school <clears throat> students um, are crazy about documenting their, their visit through photographs. And so that's part of Creative Vizcaya, thinking about artists um, whose medium is photography and how we can deepen that exploration of Vizcaya's design of our art collections, of our architecture um, through photography while they're on site. And our school programs are very, are very meaningful. We've been welcoming school students for decades. Um, they're a foundation of our community impact. And these are some examples of how students describe the impact of a school visit. Every school student that comes to Vizcaya receives a form with about five open-ended prompts. So this is one of them. My visit to Vizcaya will help me. And then the student completes the sentence. And these are some actual examples from students in Miami-Dade County who have visited Vizcaya and responded to this sentence. Um, we have over the past several months cataloged and transcribed 3,804 feedback forms each of them include about five prompts. And so we're gonna be looking at all of this data to really understand um, what the impact of a visit to Vizcaya looks like through the student's eyes and from their point of view. You can see students here exploring Vizcaya. They all have maps because that's part of the experience, how to read a map while exploring and navigating your way through the gardens. And here you see some students um, focusing on the painted ceiling of the casino loggia on the garden mound. And hopefully this gives you a sense of the kind of impact we're having. Students are thinking about their career, they're thinking about history, and they're also thinking aspirationally to thinking how to apply um, confidence and effort um, to achieve something important. So we wonder about your experiences, whether you visited Vizcaya um, as a student, and if you did, um, please chat it in. We'd love to hear about it. Um, this is, school experiences are really something that's part of uh, Miami's collective memory, and, and we love hearing about these. This is opening day at Vizcaya in 1954. We're also very proud of the ways um, that we've built stronger connections and relationships with our Coconut Grove neighborhood, thinking about the Bahamian legacies um, that Vizcaya and Coconut Grove share in common. 
In 2018, we hosted a tea party and invited 30 Black legacy residents, many of Bahamian heritage, to share their memories about Coconut Grove um, and some stories with us. At Vizcaya, a Bahamian workforce supported the construction of the gardens and provided landscaping and farming experience from a tropical environment that was really critical um, to Vizcaya's uh, formal gardens and, and urban farming uh, at the time success. So through our deepened relationships, we've had a variety of experiences. In February 2020, we launched the Rich and Forgotten History of Black Coconut Grove, a public program series um, to explore our shared history. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. We were also, during the pandemic, collecting oral stories. And this is something that you can find um, on our website, which talks about Coconut Grove's um, self-made millionaire EWF stirrup. Carver Elementary School invited us to present virtual lessons about Bahamian heritage. We presented um, for about six months urban farming lessons after school at the barnyard in Coconut Grove. And during the pandemic, while schools were closed, our, our staff and colleagues um, participated in distributing a weekend food pantry to families of FS Tucker School because um, the schools were closed. Um, this was a way for us to uh, connect with our community. We're really grateful that we've had this opportunity and we wanna share a little bit about um, why this is so important. At the public program in February, 2020, um, Dorothy Fields recalls asking a librarian why there weren't more books about black people. And the answer they gave me uh, changed my life and the life of the entire community of Miami-Dade County. She said, I guess those people haven't thought enough of themselves to write their history. I, I couldn't prove her wrong. Here I am, a school librarian. Uh, my uh, parents, grandparents came to Miami from Harbor Island, Bahamas, uh, at the turn of the 20th century, first to Key West and then to Miami's color town, Overtown. Uh, and I had never seen any books about blacks, local blacks, but I thought there must have been some that I just missed them. I guess those people haven't thought enough of themselves to write their history. And it struck me like a ton of bricks. It motivated me, and that's been over 45 years ago, and I'm still motivated. And I decided over some time to do something about it and started collecting obituaries and photographs. And that's how the Black Archives started. So here's an important lesson. One person can make a big significant difference. And I'd like to introduce you to some of our friends, um, Carol Davis Henley Bird, the late Edwina Prime, and also Leona Cooper Baker. These are some of the women, the matriarchs that we met in Coconut Grove who shared their stories with us in fact, in the 1980s, Leona um, would invite people into her living room to share stories about the heritage of Coconut Grove. Um, because she's so committed to preservation, she had the foresight to record those on VHS tapes. And we had the pleasure of listening to some of those stories. As a result, during the pandemic, the rich and forgotten history of Black Coconut Grove, which we originally thought would be a public program series, transitioned to this podcast today. Uh, which we co-created with our partners. It's three episodes um, and through history, stories of triumph and perseverance, and also thinking about hopes for the future, we learn how heritage is powerful and how heritage empowers all of us. We're really proud to support the documentation of these stories and to share them with, with the public and to get to know our neighborhood more. Thinking about, um, thinking about Dr. Fields' memory um, hopefully this is a really important way that we're contributing um, to the history of Miami, the history of Coconut Grove, um, and, the, and the preservation of these legacies. And we also encourage you to think about stories that you might have to share. Um, this got us really excited about stories. About a year ago, we launched Beyond Vizcaya, which is a story sharing platform um, webpage on Vizcaya's website. We started season one with themes of labor, migration, and cultural identity. We heard um, in live stream conversations with Dr. Marvin Dunn, with Asha Walker of Health in the Hood, and with State Senator Chevron Jones. And on our website, you can also 
contribute your story, we partnered with History Miami and their Miami Stories Project. So you can add your story um, to the story sharing platform. And again, thinking about Dr. Fields and how one person and many people can make a difference, how we can build the heritage um, of what Miami represents for so many people in the past, present and future. We hope that you'll join us. We hope that you'll come spend time with us. Um, perhaps you'll visit us at the craft market at the Vizcaya Village Farmers Market on March 6th. It's a great way to connect with some artists and craftspeople who will be selling their wares. It's a great way to meet um, some local farmers in, in Miami-Dade County and pick up some local produce. You can also find more ways to participate and connect with us on our calendar at vizcaya.org event. And we also hope that you might stay connected with us um, perhaps you'll follow us on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, if you don't already. So we look forward to seeing you at Vizcaya on site soon or, or maybe online. Thank you. Perfect. And that gets us into the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> and we are almost at the end of our meeting. So at this point, if anybody has questions either pertaining to Wendy's presentation or something else, um, you can raise your hand and we can promote you to a panelist so that you can be on camera and ask your question, or you are also welcome to just put your question in the chat. Um, so I do have a couple of questions that I can read off um, from the chat. The first one is from Mel Rodriguez, um, and they are wondering about uh, whether we would consider making Vizcaya a sanctuary for peacocks. Um, and I, I know that there is some controversy in the chat about peacocks. <laughs> some of our uh, participants here today are not a fan which is fine. Um, so do we have any thoughts about peacocks at Vizcaya? They already well, have they're already here. Yep. <laughs> you, it's not uncommon to see them in the Vizcaya village um, coming through the, the Coconut Grove neighborhood. It's rare to see them on the east side. I think in all of the time that I've been at Vizcaya, I've only ever seen a peacock once on the um, east side of Vizcaya. More commonly, we see them in the village. They make their way around. They spend a little time there. We hear them while we're working and, and meeting uh, over in the village. Um, I don't know, Ian, have, they, have you encountered specific problems in the gardens there with the peacocks? No, they, they spend most of their time in the village and they tend to stay put there. Um, like you said, Wendy, they do occasionally wander over to the east side, um, but they don't tend to like people very much. So we usually see them when we're closed uh, on the east side. It's, it's, I, I've never seen them in the main gardens when we're open to the public. Perfect. We do have somebody that did raise their hand asking to ask a question on camera and it's Ken Kurtz, who's one of my favorite guys. So this should be good. Let's see. Give me one second. Okay, Ken, you can go ahead and turn on your video if you like and ask your question on camera. Well, I will say, um, I'll get to give Ken a minute. If you have not had the pleasure to take a tour with Ken Kurtz yet, you are missing out. Um, he taught theater at UM uh, previously and uh, tell, tells great stories about the panels and the enclosed loja in particular. We actually have a video in our social media with him about that topic, so you can watch that. Um, okay, so it doesn't look like Ken is progressing at all. We will leave him as a panelist in case um, he would like to come on at some point. Um, but in the meantime, looks like Mel would also like to ask a question. Let's try Mel, promote to panelist. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, fantastic. Hi, good evening, everybody. Love Vizcaya, love. I'm already a member. Oh, yeah. I'm totally in love with Vizcaya. Yes, um, I did see the peacocks come in very big numbers when the pandemic was at full, you know, what was at, at its height and there was nobody at Vizcaya. They came in even bigger numbers. So I thought, wow, this is their natural habitat. It would be nice to have a sanctuary for them away from the gardens and, and then, you know, maybe something to consider one day. But the other question I had uh, was related to horses at Vizcaya. If, they, if the directors may consider bringing them back, uh, like James Deering had them or as a carriage, for example. And also I in the chat, I put a question about um, 
my understanding is that originally Mr. James Deering envisioned a canal area or there was a canal area at Biscaya where the boats would go around and then come in from the bay and then it was little boats, obviously. Would there ever be a consideration to bring that back? Is that too difficult or is that very hard as it is today in Biscaya? But I thought that was very nice of, of James Deering to ambition that canal area in going around Biscaya, like a little Venice. Uh, well, Mel, I can answer your question regarding the canals. Uh, I believe you're referring to the lagoon gardens, which were uh, to the south of the main formal gardens that survive today. And um, there were a series of islands and um, roadways and things like that that were connected by canals and were open to the bay. And the terminus of that uh, featured a large boathouse um, where Mr. Deering would keep his boats and, and so on. Um, that is all the property of the archdiocese today. And it's what um, La Salle High School, the Ermita and um, uh, Mercy Hospital is built on. Some of the original features still remain. Um, you know, you, there's a very large bridge uh, that was constructed uh, over the main canal that still remains, the Casbah still remains, and some of the original uh, royal palms uh, are, are there. Um, but, but almost all of that was filled in. And um, I have a really interesting story that was shared to me by one of the former, um, uh, she was the CFO of the archdiocese, um, and, and I don't recall her name, but um, in, in conversations with her, uh, she mentioned to me that uh, at the time the property was purchased, it was the Archdiocese of St. Augustine. Uh, Miami was not large enough to have its own archdiocese yet. And uh, it required so much fill to prepare the site for development that it almost bankrupted the archdiocese. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. So, Incredible. You know, yeah. I'll, um, I'll just quickly answer Mel's question about horses and say that, um, you know, we're definitely open to all kinds of, of ideas and possibilities going forward. As a as a uh, an institution that's accredited by the American Alliance of Museums, we're really subject to very rigorous standards for managing our, our art collections, um, our living collections, our buildings, our grounds in general, um, and. Uh, being responsible for the management and, and presentation of animals is is just a, a whole other discipline that um, uh, well zoos tend to specialize in and, and do best. Um, and there there may be opportunities in the future to imagine um, animals being here on certain occasions. But you know, for the time, we really want to be able to wrap our our arms around um, ensuring that we can care properly for the the resources that are here. Um, before we sort of take on a whole other aspect to our um, our mission, but love the idea. Thank you for explaining. Yeah, occasionally it may be interesting, right? Okay. Instead of permanently, but thank you for explaining all of that. You're welcome. Okay, uh, we do have another question in the chat, um, and I, I believe Rebecca tried to answer that right in the chat, but um, Adrian is asking about pricing, uh, at special pricing for students and seniors, why that went away, why it hasn't come back, if we would consider bringing that back. Great, I'm, I'm so glad that you asked and, and thinking about ways um, for people in our community um, to connect with and, and visit Biscaya. Um, we, we, are, we participate in a variety of partnership programs with Miami-Dade County um, that support uh, people in our community, um, particularly seniors. We participate in the Golden Ticket Program, which provides access um, to seniors who I think are 62 or 65. I can't remember which, I'd have to check. Um, over, over 62 or 65 access to a variety of cultural resources um, throughout the county. And there are specific um, days uh, when we welcome uh, Golden Ticket holders free of charge. Uh, we also participate in Culture Shock Miami, which provides um, 
Complementary admission, well, no, it provides reduced admission for two people, one of whom needs to be between the ages of 13 and 22, and the other person can be of any age. And so it's two tickets for $5 total uh, to come to visit um, this Gaia. So those are two ways that we work in partnership with Miami-Dade County. We also work in partnership with Miami-Dade um, Public Library System and the Museum Pass Program. We make passes available um, in certain seasons uh, through the library system that if you have a library card, um, you can pick up and check out and visit this Gaia for free. So those are a couple of ways um, to connect with us. Perfect. Um, Jonathan, who is joining us from the UK asked, uh, can I buy merchandise online that ships to the UK? Um, unfortunately, I don't believe that our cafe and shop currently offers that option, um, but who knows, maybe that's something that will change in the future. And thank you so much for asking. Uh, I am checking to see if anybody else has raised their hand or put any questions in the chat, but I think that we are all wrapped up in terms of questions. So I will turn it over again to Joel to just say our farewells for the evening. All right, well, um, thank you, Alex, and thank you everyone else for joining us. Um, tried to answer your questions. Uh, Hopefully we'll do a better job for those of you who didn't think we, we quite got there next time. But um, I can imagine we could probably dedicate several episodes of, of the Skya Town Hall to, um, to peacocks and um, various types of reptiles. So we really appreciate your spending the evening with us. Um, definitely also wanna thank all of you who are engaged in the, in the chat. We appreciate you keeping us um, on our toes throughout the meeting. If you won one of our giveaways, you'll be receiving an email with instructions on how to claim your membership and other prizes by the end of the week. And if you didn't win a membership, I hope you will consider checking out uh, the membership program on our website at viscaya.org slash membership. Uh, we definitely hope to see you at our next virtual town hall. Um, and uh, I believe um, Alex might flash the uh, dates going forward, but our next virtual town hall will be May 18th and the one after that, August 24th. So we thank you so much for your, um, your love and support of and interest in Vizcaya and um, look forward to seeing you again. Thanks so much.